many familiar faces who are joining today. Um, so I had the privilege of discussing with Robbie this morning, and as always, we will open it up to um, to everyone here to see if anyone has a case they would like to present today. Maddie, you're too, too kind. Um, yeah, I, I would be delighted if everyone, anyone has a case for us, but I actually have two shout outs today for two non, uh, a, 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 not a non members of the team, but members of the VMR community. One is Jazdeep, who seems to be presenting cases left, right, and center to the VMR community. Thank you, Jazdeep. I saw your uh, case. Yes, I couldn't join live, but I saw your case yesterday. It was so, so interesting. Um, and great to see you here. Are you still on the wards? Oh, yeah, it's my last. Yeah, it's my last day uh, today, and then I go back to chief duty. Um, I I don't want to take anyone else's spotlight, so if there is not a case presented today, I do have one, but only if there's no one else. But okay, thanks for the shout out. Oh, of course, awesome! I would love to hear you guys. Let's give people a minute, and if not, we'll uh, we'll uh, lean heavily on you, my friend. I also I also wanted to go <laughs> something I don't think I've acknowledged before, Maddie. Um, his name is Nasser. Um, Nasser Shah joined this meeting, as I can tell from the email, like four hours early. Um, so oh, just, no. <laughs> I, I imagine that you might have gotten the time uh, uh, PST, EST all messed up like I do all the time, but I just saw the email that you had joined the meeting four hours before and was just in awe. So thank you for uh, your commitment to the cause. It's so cool to see. Maddie, the mic is yours. I haven't seen the chat yet to see you. No, sir, I'm not sure if I've actually met you yet. Are you in a place where you can unmute and introduce yourself? If not, all good. Uh, don't, oh, in Kashmir. Well, welcome Nasser. I'm sorry that you joined four hours early, but we're happy you're here. And last call if anyone else has a case. If not, we will <laughs> potentially lean on Jazz for one of your amazing cases. I think this could be a record for the most most cases presented by one person in one week's time. <laughs> Going once, anyone else have a case? Going twice. <laughs> Jazz, are you up for presenting again? Yeah, um, like I said, it's a patient that we're uh, taking care of on service. So uh, it might not be as organized as uh, some other presentation if that's okay with everyone. <clears throat> All good. Whenever you say it's not an organized presentation, it ends up being an incredible case presentation. So don't don't believe that. <laughs> I feel like uh, it's a good 30 minute case. Uh, so awesome. um, all right. So thanks again for giving me the opportunity to present. Let me just pull up. Um, so um, oh, we have, uh, are we ready to begin? Okay. Yeah, we're ready. All right, so we have uh, an 81 year old gentleman uh, who presented uh, to the emergency department for dizziness um, and then jaundice. Uh, he was absurdly yellow. Um, I. I I guess I can share this because uh, we were joking about it. He looked like a character from The Simpsons, like that yellow. Uh, so, uh, you know, he, John this and dizziness, he actually was getting worked up by his PCP. So clearly not toxic appearing, not uh, in any type of discomfort, but he, he started getting dizziness and that's when his PCP said that he should go to the hospital for further evaluation. His past medical history is notable for um, peripheral artery disease, with reduced ABIs in the right calf claudication and has been dealing with uh, a pretty like in fact a pretty badly infected right toe for the past like month and a half. We've been seeing a podiatrist for this. Aortic valve replacement, um, heart failure, hypertension. And um, he went to his PCP when he started noticing that he was getting yellow. Um, and his wife and himself was concerned, so he, they brought him in. And his, um, I'm going to share his lab. Um, his ALT was um, 1132. His AST was 674. His ELKFOS was 749. 
and his T-Billy was 27.3. I'm going to pause there. Yeah, oh my gosh, wow, this is um, really such an interesting start already. So, um, you know, diving into the chief concerns of dizziness and jaundice, you know, I have actually, you know, I've thought about each of these chief concerns separately before, but I don't think I've ever really thought about the overlap. So that will be something that'll be interesting to dive into. Um, but if I'm gonna choose which one to prioritize or kind of dive into first, I'm gonna choose jaundice just because there's, um, dizziness can mean a lot of different things to different people. And I think when you think about dizziness, you really want to clarify exactly what the person is feeling. Like, is that lightheadedness? Is it um, kind of presyncope, vertigo? So I'm going to focus in on the jaundice because the dizziness chief concern can be, um, you want to really kind of clarify what the person means by that first. So for jaundice, um, at a high level, I've, you know, I think, she, Robbie, I think you've described it in this way that's been really clarifying to me, like, is this a heme issue or is this a hepatic issue? And um, you can think of the buckets, is this pre-hepatic, like a hemolysis picture? Is this um, intrahepatic or is this uh, post-hepatic, like, you know, an obstruction of the biliary tree, for example? So if we, you know, we'll need to get, um, we have the total ability, but we'll want to know if this is direct or indirect to make progress on that. I think because there's dizziness with the jaundice, I'm wondering if perhaps dizziness could be a reflection of an anemia picture here. So maybe there could be like maybe one way to tie these two together is there's um, hemolysis um, resulting in anemia, and maybe that that could result in this person being dizzy. We already have one explanation for that because there's a prior aortic valve replacement, so maybe. Could there be like valve hemolysis? That's one way to kind of tie these things together. And then last thing I'll comment on is that the ALT in the thousands, I think there's not many things that cause um, liver enzymes in the thousands. So already that's, we can kind of like narrow the differential just by the height of that elevation. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think some of those can be, um, you know, ingestions like, um, like a Tylenol ingestion, some uh, infections as well, some uh, like a hepatitis picture, and then um, certain infections that I'm kind of forgetting. But um, I know that just the height of that, those liver enzymes can, uh, can kind of help us make progress because not many things cause the elevation that high. Um, so going forward on exam, I think I'd be curious to see if there's signs of any chronic liver, like any signs of chronic liver um, injury, like signs of cirrhosis, you know, portal hypertension, high estrogen. Um, and we wanna clarify a little bit of the time course, like when exactly this jaundice started, how many days was it before he went to his PCP? Um, Robbie, what are, what are you thinking? No, I have nothing to add. I think that was absolutely superb, truly. Just tell us more, please. Yeah, that was excellent. Great job, Maddie. Um, so some more history. Um, in the PCP, in addition to getting those basic labs, did get a bunch of other, um, which I'll hold on to for now. But in addition to the PCP, he was also seeing his podiatrist, like I mentioned earlier. And um, his right toe uh, did look pretty infected and um, received uh, a five-day course of Augmentin. This was about a month ago, uh, and then came back to see the same podiatrist and did not seem like it was improving significantly. So got a second course of uh, augment in about a, uh, two weeks prior to going to his uh, PCP, uh, sorry, about um, 10 days before going to his PCP. Um, his PCP did get lab um, and basically revealed uh, he got F actin uh, and NA, hepatitis A, B, and C, um, and did get a fractionated bili, which showed uh, a direct bilirubinemia. It was 20, the direct bilirubin was 22.9, um, and indirect was like mildly elevated. He also got a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. Um, which I'm going to uh, be on a second here. 
uh, basically no uh, no definite findings within the abdomen or pelvis to explain the patient's symptoms was what the radiologist wrote. There was a contracted bladder, uh, difficult to assess intraluminal pathology. Um, and then the radiologist noted that in 2011, in the prior ultrasound, he did have some gallstones that were present. Um, and then there was also some evidence of diverticulosis without, some ev without evidence of diverticulitis. Uh, on exam, his vitals were good. Um, 136 over 62, so maybe mildly hypertensive, but he does have history of hypertension. Um, tachycar not tachycardia, uh, 88 was his heart rate, respir respirating at uh, 14 uh, breaths per minute, uh, and he was standing well in room air, not febrile. Uh, his heart and lungs sounded good. His abdomen was not distended. There was no sequela or stigmata of cirrhosis uh, on, his, on his examination. Um, pleasant, conversational, and um, he he did have, like I said, he was exquisitely jaundiced um, on face, by far the most, and then chest, upper extremities, but very minimal lower extremities. Um, so he was jaundiced pretty, uh, from basically had to, to torso. Um, we repeated his lab here in the hospital. So this was like a day after his PCP did. And it revealed um, similar results. Of, uh, his ALT was 1,048. Uh, AST was 571. His ELK was 8, 817. His direct ability now was 20.7. His indirect ability was 4.6 total was 25.3. And then he, his, uh, he had, his BMP was also pretty interesting. He had um, a hyponatremia of 125, a mild hyperkalemia of 5.2, a low chloride of 89, uh, and he had a new AKI uh, of 1.35, um, which his baseline was uh, 1.06. And then he did go up, his creatinine did jump up to 1.8 uh, during his hospital. So I'll pause there. Wow. Oh, actually, okay. sorry, one second. Uh, no, he's sorry, one, not anemic at all. Uh, his, not anemic. His, yeah, his CBC was uh, 5.9 for white count. Um, hemoglobin was 14.3. Dramatic at 40, platelet 201. And his INR was 1.2. Uh, PT was 13.5. Um, All right. So interesting here. So I think, um, you know, in terms of how I'm framing this patient, um, you know, and again, I just wanted to clarify, I'm not sure if I missed this, Jez, but does he know around how long he's noticed the jaundice? I'm not sure if I missed that. So it was progressive. Like, uh, initially, he noticed kind of maybe yellowing of the eyes, but probably just, you know, didn't make much of it. But then, like, uh, so overall, it's probably noticed it about a week, but then they got more, it got worse, and then he right. went to see his PCP. Okay. But he went to see his PCP when his face was, like, very yellow. Okay, awesome. So I, I think that's important here, the time course, because overall i'm framing this as someone with you know subacute jaundice um and that's important here because it's it's very different from the causes of you know chronic liver injury and um that's reinforced from the exam because we don't have any signs of of chronic liver in injury like um stigmata of cirrhosis as jazz said so i think the things that will help us make the most progress are actually um you know what we knew from the last alquat so the liver enzymes up into the thousands. I think that's still pretty specific. So I think I'll want to focus on that. And the other information that we got that this was, that this is a direct hyperbilirubinemia. And so that's important because that makes hemolysis and like a prehepatic cause less likely. So I'm focusing more on, is this an intrahepatic or extrahepatic cause of liver injury? And so I'm going to try to kind of in my mind overlay causes of intra and extra hepatic liver injury with things that can cause 
um, an elevation in liver enzymes up to the thousands. And so some of the things we've talked about are infections. And so we know that some infections can cause, you know, an intrahepatic liver injury, which could explain the enzymes up to the thousands. Um, I think, let's see, I, I think if someone also put this in the chat and I remember that ischemic um, injury to the liver can also cause liver enzymes up to the thousands. And that might also be a way to um, connect the AKI we have here. If there's some, pre I'm trying to tie in the AKI too. So AKI, right, can be pre intra or post renal. And I'm wondering if there's like a, if there's not enough perfusion to the kidney. So maybe there's not enough perfusion to the liver, not enough perfusion to the kidney. That could be a way to combine those. Um, but really, I think maybe we need to make progress on this. Is this um, intrahepatic or extrahepatic liver injury? So maybe we could start with like a, a red requadrant ultrasound or imaging of the liver to see if there's um, dilation of the common bile duct. Um, if there's like a dilated CVD, maybe that's more um, suggestive of extra hepatic. So maybe start with some imaging there. And then because we know of certain um, toxins and infections that can cause liver injury this high, I would maybe get, do some, start both um, do some targeted history questions towards that, like ask about any recent weird ingestions he's had. Um, and then also just send off some tests for some of the infections that can cause those, uh, that can cause the elevated liver injury. So really the hepatitis panel, um, maybe even EBV and CMV. So just kind of send those um, tests because we don't wanna miss those infections. And those are some things that we know can cause liver enzyme elevation that high. And then a little bit kind of go back to the history about any weird ingestions and then also get some imaging of the liver. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Absolutely. I'm now also seeing that, yeah. What do you think, Ravi? I'll help you with a piece of data that I think um, didn't get a, a prominent, it wasn't prominent because it was so normal, but um, JAS has for you a CT abdomen pelvis that is normal. Oh. So what do you, how are you, <laughs> how, are you at all? How, are, how is that helping you think now that you have that data? Um, CT abdomen and pelvis that's normal. Yeah. yeah. No dill, dill, no pancreatic issues, no stones. So I think that would make me more concerned of an intrahepatic issue um, because for extrahepatic, as you said, maybe you would see some, mm -hmm. some signs of something causing the obstruction, whether it's stones or a mass or, yeah. Exactly, yeah. It's hard to invoke post-renal AKI without hydro. And similarly, it's hard to invoke extrahepatic biliary disease without biliary dilation. The truth is you probably didn't need a CT to be 90% of the way there anyway, because there's only one cause of extrahepatic biliary disease that is so powerful that it can cause your ALT to skyrocket to 1132, because there is no ALT in the extrahepatic biliary tree. The ALT is very specific for the liver parenchyma itself. And so when the fact is that the ALT is affected so profoundly, odds are that um, the disease is in the liver itself, though there is one exception, one extra hepatic disease um, that um, can do this. And I think what's really, really intriguing to pay attention to, uh, Maddie, is that um, you actually have two different problems here, believe it or not. You have marked acute liver injury over a thousand, but you also have marked uh, cholestasis. So yeah. what does that mean? That means that, yeah, the AST and ALT dysfunction can actually cause hyperbilirubinemia because the hepatocytes are required to excrete the bilirubin. But in addition to the AST, ALT, and T bili, which you can lump together as acute hepatocellular injury, you also have a ridiculously high alk -FOS elevation. So my problem representation to answer Sammy's question would be an adult gentleman with subacute mixed hepatocellular and cholestatic liver disease. And the reason this is mixed is because both the AST, ALT, and the ALK-FOS are elevated. Hepatocellular disease causes hyperbilirubinemia through impaired cell excretion. Cholestatic disease causes impaired bilirubin excretion in the bile duct cells, but the combination of the two is present here. And so, um, if you're thinking, okay, what's my schema for acute liver injury? 
And then what's my schema for primary intrahepatic cholestasis? The answer to this case is probably going to lie in the overlap of the two. And so our growth will be, how do we um, bolster our intrahepatic acute liver injury schema? And how do we bolster our primary intrahepatic cholestasis schema? And what's the overlap in the two? Um, and I think that, uh, that that is an unusual, we don't usually have uh, a disease that has features of both. How does that jive with you or what questions do you have about that? Yeah, that's, um, I, I think it was, no, I think it's interesting to point out that, yeah, the elk phosphorus was also really elevated. I think I was focusing a little bit on um, the bilirubin and the liver enzymes because of the, the height of the ALT, but I, I think that's um, a really helpful point to point out that the elk phosphorus is also elevated and maybe um, either it's an infiltrative process or it's maybe an infection affecting both the, the biliary and um, the hepatocytes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's play a little game real quick. So if you had to sort of just go off reflexes, category-wise, like big picture mm -hmm. examples would be cancer, autoimmune, like big picture categories. Mm -hmm. What do you think of, of, of big picture categories of uh, acute severe hepatocellular injury? So acute severe hepatocellular injury, big categories, I think infection, um, and I think ingestion of toxins. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, maybe sh like a shock, like a ischemia too. The most two most common are ingestions, like medications, toxins, so on, molecules, um, and infections. And then when you go into like primary intrahepatic cholestatic disease, which is actually something that we're probably less familiar and comfortable with, but worth taking a shot. What what do you know of there? Primary intrahepatic. Um, maybe the same thing. I mean, same categories. I would think like infections. Ingestion. Hmm. I don't know if ingestion would affect the biliary as much as the liver because um, they wouldn't be metabolized by it, but yeah. definitely the infection category. What infections can you think of that do this? So, um, really high alphas and really high bili with a normal imaging, like no bil bil, no. Yeah, I remember several, many, many VMRs back, you talked about. Um, like professional infections and then I forget the other word, but <laughs> I, I think so hepatitis, the different hepatitis is, um, I don't know if this would affect the biliary system. Oh, no, not really. That okay, was... so exclude those. Um, but- Did you just join VMR, by the way? What? Kirtan, Kirtan just joined VMR and I think- it's Oh, Kirtan! Kirtan. <laughs> because the infections that cause pure intrahepatic cholestasis are kirtan infections. They're rare, esoteric, and super nerdy. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, well, kirtan, put your thoughts in the chat. <laughs> the um, but oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So some of the other infections are like, like EBV, CMV, maybe. Um, I'm forgetting some of the other ones that would cause it. Well, why are you forgetting them? Because they're ridiculously rare. The most common cause of pure intrahepatic cholestatic disease is drugs, 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 drugs. Um, and usually it's usually medication. The second most common is autoimmune disease. Mm. Immune disease, the champion autoimmune disease is PBC, primary biliary cholangitis. So let's take this case out and separate it. Pretend this case is just AST 1132. I, um, AST 600, T bili high, alkphos normal. That would tell you the most common causes are the patient has an infection, hep A through E, or the patient has an ingestion or toxin, usually acetaminophen. Mm -hmm. Let's play this case out separately and say the AST is normal, the ALT is normal, the alkphos is 749, and the bili is high. That would tell you, probabilistically speaking, that the patient is either having an ingestion or has PBC. And if you study the overlap of a combination of marked hepatocellular and marked cholestatic, the answer is usually drugs, 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 drugs. Um, so if you just say, my problem representation is this is an 81-year-old man with marked mixed hepatocellular and cholestatic liver injury, you got to go to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean to find the medications or exposures. Mm -hmm. that you have. Uh, and sometimes that, that journey goes literally under the earth to find what hidden herbal supplement they have in the back of their cabinet that they're taking without realizing it. Um, 
that's how characteristic this this feature is but but we have to remain humble just because it's characteristic doesn't mean the patient isn't immune to other presentations but i just want to highlight the the schemas that you're making acute liver injury medications ingestion uh, infections and medications slash toxins hep a through e acetaminophen Primary cholestatic disease is ingestions or medications and autoimmune disease, PBC. The overlap, very suggestive of, of a drug. So really look hard for that. Sure. Any questions about any of that? So yeah, I think we're kind of narrowing in on ingestion and drugs a little bit here. And I'm just looking at the whiteboard and um, the only med we see is augmenting a month prior to admission. Would I don't, I don't think I've ever heard of that causing this, but is, um, have you ever heard of augmenting kind of causing this much liver injury or? Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, I, maybe I'll, I'll the hook. <laughs> Fantastic review in the New England Journal of Medicine of drug-induced liver injury that I would highly recommend all of you read at some point in the near future. It'll really reinforce um, this case. And augmentin is unfortunately a heavy lifter in this domain. Oh man. Okay, Jazz, what happened? Was it the augmentin? Um, I think I, I'll share one more eloquent if, if you guys want. Uh, so the results of the workup that the PCP did, um, <clears throat> like came back actually while we were in the we were still taking care of him. The, he sent an IgG, which is normal, um, F-actin, mitochondria anybody, hep A, B, and C were all normal. Um, EBV was normal. His COVID did come back positive, but he was asymptomatic. Um, his amylase, normal, lipase, normal. Uh, his iron studies uh, came back. Iron was elevated at 282, CIBC 301 was uh, in the normal range. Transferrin saturation was 94%, which is high. Ferritin was um, high as well, 4,900. Um, and then uh, we also for the... Uh, hyponatremia checked the serum os osmols, which was 288. His uh, urine FE urea was consistent with pre-renal uh, AKI for further history. He was taking his torsamide and um, other medications uh, like uh, lisinopril and stuff and wasn't really drinking as, as often because I think he was just kind of getting a little worn down from his uh, liver injury and probably didn't have the greatest PO intake. And then this is the last adequate. The next one will reveal the answer. I know you uh, oh, yeah, yeah, no. But, so I think it's, um, the iron studies are interesting because it, it seems like this is showing a picture of iron overload. Um, and people are putting in the chat, but that, you know, if you think of kind of a high iron, iron overload and liver injury, you can connect that with the hemochromatosis picture. Um, so I'm a little bit, I'm just, I think I want to familiar, familiarize myself with like the time course. I would maybe expect this to be a little bit more of a, a chronic picture, but um, maybe the person just kind of noticed this in a subcute man, but maybe this has been going on for a longer period of time. Um, so with those additional studies, I think I'd be most concerned for maybe hemochromatosis. Um, and that's where my mind is going. I'm a little bit surprised because it wasn't really what I was thinking kind of leading up to this, but. Yeah. You know, Maddie, uh, my dad, who's since, been, who's since passed, told me that I was a very stubborn human being when I was five or six. And I remain very stubborn about uh, what I think is going on in this case in large part because um, the, the, pre the evidence of iron overload should certainly make you think of hemochromatosis in a patient with presenting with liver disease. However, when you apply a little bit more specificity about what we mean by liver disease, you realize that hemochromatosis is not a strong contender in this case because hemochromatosis presents with slowly progressive liver disease and would be uh, very unusual to present with acute hepatocellular injury. That's yeah. in strong contrast to its cousin Wilson's disease, another heavy metal overload syndrome, which can actually present with acute and chronic. Mm. So here, um, just like alcohol liver disease, hemochromatosis very rarely causes AST, ALT this high. Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, coupled with the fact that many uh, liver diseases, including hepatitis C and other ones, predispose patients to iron overload. Um, I think that I would probably use these tests and explore the possibility of unrelated hemochromatosis to what's happening now. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I remain, I think, most worried about um, augmentin. Yeah, either way, I think, um, just like we stop nephrotoxic medications in patients with AKI, even though we're not sure if they're causing the problem, in this instance, I think you probably stop the augmentin since the patient was re-exposed recently. Mm -hmm. And then you wonder, what more do I need to, to diagnose this condition? Do I need a liver biopsy? Or um, do I just stop the augmentin and, and let it... Um, wash away. And just for clarity, when we talk about drug-induced liver injury, we're talking about two, um, uh, this is two seconds, we're talking about two different, oh, nice. <laughs> uh, we're talking about two different things. We're talking about a predictable reaction. So when patients take a certain drug and they take too much of it, like acetaminophen, that's called a dose-dependent liver injury. Augmentin is an idiosyncratic drug reaction. We have no idea why some a fraction of patients get a devastating liver injury. So this is completely unpredictable and dose independent and is probably more immunologic plus drug than it is pure drug alone. I really hope we're on the right track because we've been talking about it for so long. Yeah. Right? Completely plus <laughs> I know enough to tell you that I'd be pretty worried about it in this, in this patient. But of course, I think that drug-induced diseases are hard to diagnose. They're often diagnosed with just stopping the drug and seeing what happens. But in some patients, you go that extra step of getting histopathological confirmation, which actually has a characteristic appearance when they do pathology. I don't know it, but I know that pathologists can tell you with a lot of confidence that there's a drug on board here. Hmm. Yeah, what are you thinking? So interesting. Yeah, I kind of, I agree that I did not have, an, I had never heard of kind of hemochromatosis causing um, elevations of the enzymes that high. So, um, you know, even when I saw the, the elevated ferritin and things like that, I, you know, had it on the back of my mind, but it, I agree that it doesn't quite fit the presentation and more concerned of like a drug induced picture. So, um, yeah, I think yeah, that might yeah. also be what's going on, but investigate that on the side potentially. Amazing. And, you know, Nasser is making a really important point in the chat that all this conversation about drug induced disease should be predicated on ruling out infectious causes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, Justice updated us in the chat that the Hep A was negative and Hep E uh, was not tested, which is why, since the prevalence in the U.S. is very, very low. All right, Jazz, take it home for us, please. Great. Um, can I ask a quick question before I uh, reveal them? And so I, I understand that the liver is definitely the more important thing, but do you got, do either you or Maddie want to comment on the um, hyponatremia with the still magma two eighty eight? Uh, Maddie, I can take a stab at that real quick. I think that I, I yeah. is a very, very um, important finding to reflect on. I think the 30-minute format um, uh, makes me put my ear hat on. But um, I think um, you have a really interesting finding here, Maddie, which is that this, your, the serum sodium is low, but the osms are normal, just to summarize it for you. So I'd love for you to take a crack at that. What is that summary of like a low um, serum osm? With as low as serum sodium, but a normal serum osm, what does that do for you? Yeah, so, um, so yeah, hyponatremia, you think of, so the normal serum osm, you can think of two possibilities. It's like um, a concurrent hypo and hyperosmolar process yeah. happening, or is there like a pseudo hyponatremia? Um, exactly. Yeah. You nailed it. And in this specific instance, I think Shema told us the, the reason why the patient might have pseudo hyponatremia. Oh. The lipoprotein. Yeah, good thought, Shema. Oh, yeah, she nailed it. The, the presenter here. Let me. I think somebody's accidentally unmuted. Um, oh, it's our dear friend Kirtan. I think we're hearing his family for the first time live on VMR. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think Sham is Sammy presented a case. Uh, a long yeah. Time. Do you remember that? I, I think I like. I think I reflected on that case for a Saturday session. But yeah, I totally remember that, and I think would. With, it can be high in cholestasis exactly because the liver um, can excrete it. Okay. Wow, throwback. <laughs> awesome. Look at Jazz trying to make sure we get all the learning out of this case. Thank you so much. Tell us what happened. No, no, of course. Uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting in my part because when I when we sent the serum osms, it was like it's consistent with pseudohyponatremia. So I 
we added on a lipid panel and he, in the span of a week, because his PCP also tested it, uh, his lipid panel with the uh, total cholesterol to HDL ratio went from 8.1 to 30.8. So it was secondary to hyper, be a hypercholesterolemia secondary to his liver injury. But yeah, you guys nailed this from the very beginning. It was really secondary to uh, augment and uh, in the sense that his workup was negative. He was, I think we classified this as painless jaundice. Uh, like he, he wasn't having any abdominal pain. CT was negative. Um, and basically we provided supportive care and just kind of made sure that he was, uh, his, his uh, creatinine was down trending. We did have a small pause to see, was, you know, was his AKI secondary to like bile acid nephropathy, but uh, low suspicion quickly how, considering how like quickly his, uh, his creatinine resolved. So uh, I thought this was a, a good quick case. Uh, I think the jaundice and, and liver enzymes always have a good differential. And then when I saw the pseudohyponatremia, uh, I think I missed Sammy's case then because this was uh, when I when I saw the cholesterol jump, I was like, you know, looking to see why. And then I found out that a, a cholestatic injury can uh, release a bunch of cholesterol. And uh, for the ferritin, uh, yeah, we, we, did, we didn't bother curbsiding or talking to GI just because it was just a liver injury. Um, and his last iron studies were actually pretty normal. His, la his last iron studies was done in like 2015 and there, his transference saturation at the time was 25%. So we weren't very concerned about uh, hemochromatosis, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Jazz, thank you so, so, so much for presenting. This was such a great case to, this was just a lot of fun for, for me to discuss because these are just, just really interesting topics um, for me. And uh, I think some uh, learning points that I want to go back and review is, you know, for acute liver injury, I think I had in my mind like drugs, ingestions, and some infections, but I really had no idea like what drugs are kind of most are commonly invoked in drug-induced liver injury. And it sounds like Augmentin is one that has, um, you know, there's a good amount of literature on that. So I think I wanna do a little bit of reading about what uh, what drugs are like kind of commonly implicated in drug-induced liver, liver injury. Um, and then the other thing is I think a big um, like anchor point in this case was the severe elevation in um, liver enzymes. So I think going back and refreshing myself on what are all those things that you should really make sure are top of your mind when you see an ALT that high. Um, so thank you so much, Jazz. This was really a, a fun case to discuss. And thanks, Robbie, for discussing with me. Yeah, Jazz, I couldn't agree more than Maddie. I think that um, you really are showing us your love and passion for medicine. And I find I admire that and respect that so much, just how much you uh, how you bring these cases to the forefront, how you emphasize the learning and how you present them. And really, really a lot of admiration and respect for you. Um, and very grateful that you're able to join us so often when you're on service. I wish we had you here all the time, honestly. Um, and Maddie, I, I don't know um, if I, I'm more in awe of the medicine, which I usually am, than I'm actually more in awe of what you showed us. I think it was just so amazing to see how you were so authentic with what you know and what you feel like you need to grow in. Like I didn't feel the need to say anything in your first two aliquots. And and the last one, when the when when you were analyzing the labs more closely, I think you were just so inviting to the idea that like you could make connections, but you weren't confident about how robust the connections were. And um, it's really cool to um, it's really cool as an educator and a teacher to feel comfortable um, being authentic and transparent with the learner and pushing them as far as um, as far as one can. And I think your humil your confidence early coupled with humility at the end is, I think, a role model for everybody to try to follow. You don't, you have, you can't be confident all the time. That's not real. And if you're showing humility left, right, and center, you're leaving your skills on the table. And I think it's that like fine balance of being authentic of, hey, I know this part really well. And this part, hey, not not so much, I think is 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 really, really admirable. And I think something we can all strive for. All right, Leah, take us home, please. Well, thank you everyone for um, joining this. I think it was such an interesting case because um, one, the way I think the style of presenting was also really cool. But then you remember we started actually with dizziness, but then we didn't talk about dizziness at all, except for the first um, sentence. 
So why was that? Because dizziness is so unspecific. And um, Maddie also mentioned, first, we have to clarify um, what does the patient actually mean by it? Because it could go into the direction of syncope or more cerebellar process or more something psychogenic or unspecific. Um, so put that aside, we focused more on jaundice because that gave us more diagnostic um, clarity. And then we talked about, is it heme or hepatic? So that's the first branching point. And then when it's hepatic, we can divide it up into pre, intra, and post-hepatic. And lab um, workup that is always helpful with jaundice is what's the bully, what's the direct or the indirect, because that can clue us into more um, heme or hepatic as well. Then if we think of hemolysis as a cause, What's the LDH? Is the haptoglobin low? And is there anemia, which was not the case in this patient? Um, but right in the beginning, we saw that there were extremely high um, AST and ALT um, elevations, which can make us think of some few um, causes that can lead to these high elevations. And I call them the big six of hepatitis. So you can think of viral, ischemic, Wilson's, autoimmune hepatitis intoxications or DILI, so drug-induced liver injury. And um, the CT was normal in this case. And what did that make do with our thinking? It was more as an intrahepatic than extrahepatic because we would expect some biliary dilation or something to cause this cholestasis um, and to, to see kind of an obstructive cause if it's post or extrahepatic. Just think of the acute kidney injury. If it's post-hepatic, then you also expect some kind of obstruction and check that with the ultrasound. But then we analyze the LFT pattern more closely. Is it hepatocellular? So we look at AST and ALT, or is it more cholestatic? So the ALKFOS. And um, some interesting and helpful examples we um, heard were hepatocellular, think of ingestions or infections. Um, then is it pure intrahepatic or intrahepatic cholestatic? So in the liver, but cholestatic, so alcohol elevation, primarily drugs. That's what we were taught by this case and autoimmune diseases. And um, what then this combination of mixed hepatocellular and cholestatic, but we didn't see any evidence of post-hepatic was like medication, medication. Um, and remember, one of the big six of hepatitis was Wilson up there. So in the time course, um, the difference between the two diseases that are heavy metal overload hepatopathies, Wilson's and hemochromatosis, um, is the progression of the disease and how it presents. Wilson's can be acute like this, but hemochromatosis is typically not. So we expect more of a chronic time course. And um, then lastly, as we focused in on drug-induced liver injury, we can divide this up even more into a dose-dependent form and an idiosyncratic form, which would be an example of augmenting, as in this case. And lastly, this pearl that we got reminded um, on was that cholestasis impairs the excretion of lipoprotein X, and this can lead to the pseudo-hyponatremia and um, yeah, so there was lots of learning in this case. Thank you for joining and see you next time. Ooh, that was amazing. Absolutely superb. Thank you for the contrast between Wilson's and hemochromatosis. I love that. I think that's a schema waiting to happen. So if you haven't made it already, you should. And that was so, so cool. All right, y'all. Uh, thank you for hanging out today. Hope to see you next time. Bye.